Welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Peter Martin. I'm delighted to say my guest on this programme is actor, writer, comedian Sanjeev Kohli. Um, there you are. I, I've got all three skills in there. If I've missed any skill set, I apologise. A cut keys. <laughs> Which one of those mm. gives you the most joy because it's what you're naturally, where you feel comfortable? I think probably... Um it's typical because my route into what I do now is is that it, it was nothing I ever intended. But I started as a radio presenter who, because he watched loads of comedy, then got into comedy writing, but never thought, even though presenting is, a, as you'll know, is, is, is performing, but it's not quite acting. Never thought, I still didn't think I'd be an actor at that point, but then fell into the acting. And even the, the comedian thing, I think when people when you're labelled a comedian, people think you're a stand-up. And I'm not a stand-up. I mean, yeah. what I do is in, obviously in the similar arena, but I... I admire, even shy stand-ups I admire because I think it's, <laughs> do you know I mean, even, even if you're rubbish, I admire what you do because it's the bravery. I think people don't realise. Maybe they do. Yeah. Because people say, I know it can be funny at the pub, but I don't know if I could actually go on the stage and then. Well, can I ask you this question then? Just, I mean, I've got so many things I want to ask you and, and discuss with you because of all the talents that you've displayed over the years. Um, I've often looked at comedians standing up for five minutes and I'd look and i go, I could easily do that, mm. you know. But then I, I remember reading uh, Bob Hope's book when he basically said, you know, I can deliver something, but I've managed to hire the seven best writers in Hollywood. Aye. They do the they do the material. I deliver it. Well, actually, on on that note, I, I've been I've been um, there's a really really good stand up called Bill Dewar. So we we've, we've been doing these um, audience with shows with the Still Game Cast, and Bill, who's a really really funny stand up and like a seasoned pro sort of thing. Um, has been comparing the shows. I'm hanging out a lot with Bill when we chat about comedy, and and he says, he says it's a different skill. He, for for him, a stand up is someone that writes his or her own material and delivers that. Right? Yeah. He says there's a, there's an absolute skill in getting writers in and delivering that and making it your own. But for him, there's a difference. It be, it's a different skill set. Um, I mean, uh, Bob was obviously famous for it. Um, but I mean, if I were to do stand up, I would write it all myself. I, I, I just think that. All the best stand-ups have that thing that they do. I mean, I don't, I don't think anyone could do Eddie Izzard like Eddie Izzard does. I don't think anyone could do Billy Connolly like Billy Connolly does. I don't think anyone could do Kevin Bridges like Kevin Bridges does. Although, funnily enough, I think Kevin Bridges does have writers. He does, I mean, yeah, I was going to say that yeah. to you. But then he was a writer for Frankie Boyle. Yeah. So, you know, um, uh, I think it's... The problem as well is, is that in the old days of stand-up, I say that like I was in the business all the years, I, I wasn't, but I was always a fan of stand-up. And if you were a stand-up in the 70s, you could do your routine probably for two years. Do it all around the piers and, and the... And the without the having to... Without ever refreshing having to change a word even. Yeah. Obviously, you just, you know, hello, Lanark, you know, you change that and, and then slag off Wishaw. But, you know, that would be the only thing you need to ch change in your set. Yeah. You could do that set almost verbatim for probably two or three years before you even thought about changing it. But you look at someone like, for example, Ram Ramesh Ranganathan, his stuff all gets filmed and televised, so he's always having to... Change stuff. Yeah. I remember as well, um, I was lucky enough to um, to work with Craig Ferguson. Remember Bing Hitler? Yeah, Bing Hitler, yeah. I love Bing Hitler. Yeah. I mean, this was when I was a student before I was ever in the business. His brother was my boss. Oh, Scott. of course, Scott Ferguson <laughs> at STV. That's yeah. right. I think I worked with his sister, Karen. So um, he, um, it was dead unfortunate. So this is back in, I'm thinking, 88, this was, or 87. So I went to Glasgow Uni. They had a thing called Dark Friday, which was like a big Christmas ball. Yeah. Um, last thing before uh, Christmas holidays. Uh, and um, uh, he was booked to be the act that year. So he did his routine and he got booed. He hadn't realised that that set had been on Channel 4 or something like a week ago. Yeah. He didn't know. So, uh, and, you know, you, you can't expect to be writing new material for every show that you do. You'd be dead. Yeah, absolutely. Unless you're someone like Phil Kay who improvises everything that he does. But, I mean, that's a different skill set in itself. So um, it's very difficult for stand-ups now. I think that if, if you get to a certain level, you probably do have to write as because you couldn't possibly generate that amount of material yourself because it's voracious. You can't repeat stuff. Yeah. You can for a wee while, but <clears throat> yeah. you have to quickly shed your skin. It, it, it's a wee bit easier if you are possibly doing, uh, we, we talked about it before we come on here, Armando Iannucci, and you can look at the political uh, landscape and how it changes week to week. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, but other than that, you're right. I mean, you'd be, you'd, you'd, you'd probably blow your brains out trying to think of the pressure of trying to come up with new stuff constantly. Completely. I mean, if you, obviously, if, if someone does a tour, I mean, Edinburgh's just finished now. 
and a lot of a lot of those acts will take that as the the kind of rump of a show that they'll take on tour. In my head, they'd maybe maybe get a year out of it. Yeah, but I mean, I, I know Ed Byrne as well, who I think is a fantastic stand-up. And um, I'll say to him, you know that routine he does about ironic. Yeah, Do you know what, the Alan Ar- yep. So for people that don't know, he talks about um, ironic, but Alan Ar- Ar- says it's not ironic. Rain on your wedding day is not actually ironic. That's just bad luck. <laughs> And he said that thing about, what's that like? It's like a spoon and we need a knife. He says, that's not irony. That's just living in a knife factory. <laughs> he said, and that thing about being caught in traffic, he said, that would be ironic if when you're caught in traffic, you're a town planner <laughs> and you designed that town where you're in. And the reason you were going, you were in that town was you, you were the, the keynote speaker <laughs> at the town hall of that town talking about how you planned that town. And he, he goes, bang, 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 bang. It's brilliant, it's brilliant different uh, la- layers of jokes and I said to Ed I said I'd be happy if you dropped that into every routine you did yeah he said it just doesn't work like that with stand up you can't do your greatest hits you can't do your stairway to heaven well it's funny freebird. it's funny that because <clears throat> you know strangely enough people shout to Mickey Flanagan do it out out and Aye. you're thinking what is this a greatest hits Aye, yeah but then <laughs> I know Billy Connolly the last time I saw him he did drop in a couple of wee things he'd done before and I liked it I, I, I liked the vibe of it it wasn't like he was doing whole tracks of material again he was keeping it new and fresh but he dropped in a, a couple of old things I think that's because the whole thing about a callback in comedy is when a callback is done really well it's really satisfying yeah. so if you can even if it's something you've done years ago and you can call back to it I think that's you've earned that right to do that yeah. but I feel sorry for stand-ups that they do have to generate all this new material all the time the, the joy of having you here is because obviously more often than not I would interview footballers and managers you, you tend to look at their life chronologically Aye. the great thing about you is I can flit in out of one thing and in another and, and you mentioned the, the type of people that you like listening to I, I wonder if there are people that, who inspired you I know you liked the comedy you got into it but mm-hmm. you know who, who got your juices flowing? You thought, I want to do that. Well, that's the thing. And, and there was never a point, Peter, where I said, I want to do that. I never thought it was an option. So, like, um, it's funny you're talking about um, uh, your daughter goes to St. Owls. When I was at St. Owls, I was the shyest kid imaginable. I had national health classes. I used to, I was the guy that ran upstairs when visitors came to the house. I, I couldn't talk to people. I was really, really shy. But I used to watch loads of comedy and be a big fan of comedy and be quite kind of, I was known as the, as the young one's bore. So when young one started in, I'm thinking 82, 83, yeah. I couldn't believe that, oh, what am I watching here? It's like a live action cartoon. But also, even though I was actually a wee bit too young, because obviously it was aimed at students and above, and I was 12, 13, I thought this is definitely for me, in a way that as much as I love the two Ronnies, it wasn't really for me. I no. mean, I, I love the wordplay and I, it, there's no greater character actor than Ronnie Barker and Ronnie Corbett's a close second or third. I, I loved that for what it was, but it didn't feel like it was speaking to me. It was guys in suits and big glasses, whereas this was like, whoa. Yeah. And that, I think, maybe maybe a switch went on in my head, but not in terms of actually doing it as a thing, just as something to enjoy. And that was the guy in the playground. Did you see what Rick, Rick Mayo said? Did you, see this? Did you see the head coming off? And you know, I got quite boring about it, but I obsessed about the young ones, watched them over. I could probably recite most of those episodes, the Bambi episode verbatim, that bit where where it's, um, I, I think it, it would go in my kind of Desert Island discs of comedy, <laughs> that, that scene where it's, it's Neil and Rick on the train going to the University yeah. Challenge are so beautifully constructed, and there's three false endings, it's like Lord of the Rings <laughs> beautiful, so that's probably the bit where <clears throat> that, that was a, a turning point, but also I have to say, the first time I saw Billy Connolly on, on Parkinson uh, God rest his soul. Yeah. I um with the mum joke. Well, actually, that wasn't the one that I saw. So uh, it's difficult. So when when you're the, the the son of an immigrant, right? So so I was three when my family came to Glasgow. So so slightly long story. Mum and dad came to London um, in '66. So they they'd been married. Um, they got married the year before. Was it an arranged marriage? Yes. Yeah. Lunch was at two. Didn't dance was at five. <laughs> And then they came, no, I'm sorry. And then they came to um, London in '66, and that's where me and my two brothers were born. I'm the youngest of three brothers. And then my dad uh, got a place in teacher training college in Dundee, of all places. Yeah. So he would commute to Dundee. Like I don't, I don't mean every day. He'd go on a Sunday and come back on a Friday. And genuinely, I, I, apparently, I would sob my eyes out when he got the bus to Dundee. And they told me they lived in a place called Blackness. Uh, is there's a place called Blackness? 
It sounds like Darth Vader's village. Yeah. But that was where my dad stayed. And ironically, my daughter went to Dundee Unit and went, was on the Blackness Road. So long story short, we came to Glasgow when I was three. So I had to learn a lot about, as, as we boy of Asian extraction with an English accent landing in Glasgow and Bishop Briggs. Yeah. It's a lot I didn't know. I didn't know what a jam piece was. I didn't know what Jeanette Cranky was. Yeah. I didn't know what Orange Walk was. And um, learning all this stuff. And then for some reason in our house, there was a Billy Connolly album, right? In amongst the Bollywood soundtracks and the Sikh devotional <laughs> songs, there was a Billy Connolly double album. I think it was Billy Connolly by Shabam. Yeah. Quite a scary looking proposition. The hair, the, he hadn't seen a dentist by this point. Yeah. Um, I think he had the kind of the black skin and, and possibly the banana boots I might be making up. But I remember looking at that and thinking, that's a scary guy. And I don't know what he's doing in my house. Yeah. And then I'm watching Parkinson. And it was when he was on and Angie Dickinson was another guest. Yeah, yeah. I think that might, I think that might have been the second or third Second or third, on. definitely wasn't yeah. the third, because the first was the bike, the, the, yeah. the bum. Yeah, he had the brown leather jacket, yes. remember? And I definitely didn't watch that when it went out, but I watched this one. Yeah. I thought, there's that guy. And I, I think I knew by this point who he was. He's from Glasgow and everyone loved him, but I didn't, I didn't have a handle on him. My dad was aware of him, but didn't, my mum had no interest. So he's on there and I'm thinking, oh my God, he's got, he's got a really, really strong Glasgow accent. He better be funny <laughs> because he's representing. The troops. <laughs> yeah. So he's there, Angie Dickinson's a similar setup to this actually. And um, he was telling, and of course, Angie Dickinson at that time was the lead in the show Police Woman, yeah. which might have been the biggest show in the world, along with Starsky and Hutch and Kojak at that time. Easily, it was about 75, 76. Aye. So she's like a massive like TV star, like Global. And she's on, and, and that guy from Glasgow. Is there like you better be funny and he's telling that thing about how he supported elton john and tour in the states and they they weren't expecting this wild scottish guy and he said that was just it was just horrible and he, he was talking about the pipe coming through the air through the mist the dry towards him. And he says but he didn't know my chin ends there, chin end there. <laughs> so it went through my beard but he said the classic line they made me feel as welcome as a fart in a spacesuit <laughs> well, that's right and angie dickinson nearly defecated the kidney <laughs> laughing and she nearly slipped off her chair laughing and he had to do that thing of kind of waiting for her to stop laughing i thought if a guy from glasgow can make the biggest tv star in the world do that there's something in this yes but also what got me about connolly was um i'm doing that thing that taxi driver do connolly uh. saying the thing about connolly is <laughs> eh? he wasn't even the funny one that shipped me else back peter he wasn't the funny one shut up exactly he got lucky he got lucky shut your face he went to australia with that stuff but what i liked about him was i mean a, again one of the classic actually possibly my favorite 45 or 50 minutes of stand-up is an audience with Billy Connolly, oh, brilliant. which as Scottish people, I mean, it's in our DNA, we can all quote it verbatim, right? But I think people forget that he was on that stage with the great and the good of British entertainment, yeah. be it Robbie Coltrane, Barbara Dixon, Wincy Willis, but Bill Wyman, <laughs> uh, Joanna Lumley, um, and it, it was just like a, everyone that was everyone at that time. Bob Hoskins. Bob Hoskins, that's yeah. right, with that brilliant look on his face where he's actually disbelief at how funny <laughs> the stuff is. And he just talks about growing up in a tenement. Yeah. And you're thinking, oh, is that gonna is that gonna land? Is that gonna travel? And clearly, it was that thing of him having the confidence of saying, it's a one tick system. If I think it's funny, it is funny. Well, can I say this to you? And and it, it relates back to the last time you and I were in each other's company, although I didn't say hello to you. Uh, <laughs> no, not not for reasons of being rude, I just it was too it was too busy to get to you. But <clears throat> the reason why everybody loved Billy Connolly is because even in the 70s, he was telling life as it was. We could relate to him. And the couple of weeks ago, I'm sitting in the GFT. Yes. You're sitting at the front. We're watching the 4K restoration of Gregory's Girl. Yes. And one of the cast members said, the reason why we love this, pro this film is because it portrayed Scottish life and not someone who's a drunk, who is a foul mouth, whatever. It was about Scottish people being Scottish people. Completely. And Completely. that was why I think people loved Conley. It resonated with them. And of course, as you say, it was incredibly funny. But same with Gregory's Girl. Oh, absolutely. It was written by Scottish people, directed by Scott. For, I mean, just for themselves, because that's what he wanted to do. And therefore, you got a pretty undiluted version of what life was like. Yeah. Did you sit in that cinema, by the way, and say, I wish I was in that movie? Oh, of course I did. Yeah. I mean, 
Uh, I, I obsess about that film a wee bit. Um, I mean, it's not without its problems. Yes. It opens with four guys ogling a nurse stripping. And you get, you get, you get, there are one or two moments in it oh, where I think oh, haven't actually moved. Oh, no, no. You know, oh, the you times. Could feel, you could feel buttocks clenching, couldn't you? Oh, I knew this was coming, but it's really uncomfortable watching it. Because I hadn't seen it in the cinema. Did you see it in the cinema before? No, I don't think I had. I hadn't seen it in the cinema. No. Uh, so it, it was a collective discomfort, but you forgave it, I think, because it's such a beautiful film. And it is beautiful. Yeah, it's um, of its time, though. It's of its time, but also still the discomfort of being a teenager is it, that's universal and that's palpable. And yeah. you played it so well. The, the, the whole cast played it so beautifully, and it was lovely that they got a chance to feel the love. I think. Yeah, and and, and in a way, at that time, and and because the cast were and John Gordon Sinclair, I mean Claire Grogan was, I mean I loved mm. Claire Grogan. I just she was one of those pinups at the time where I was right into that music. Um, it, you know, when I look at that time, it was before the train spotting. Of course. It was like, you know, they mentioned Restless Natives. Mm. It was at a point where you were saying to yourself, oh, great, there's, there's a Scottish movie scene. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and well, they should have been. Yeah. Because that's the thing. Gregory Little came, New York premiere, we've arrived and went away again. Then Restless Natives, oh, this is amazing, went away again. Yeah. And it, they, they, it's a shame because I always associate those films with each other, even yeah. though they, they aren't really anything to do with each other. But in terms of a Scotland I want to see on screen that feels like me, yeah. brilliant. But they it never really kind of reached critical mass and became the thing. And did you never feel, because you were so good in sitcoms, because you've done a few movies, do you never feel the calling to say, I've got it, I know how difficult it is to chase money to get a movie made. It's really, really Aye. tough. Um, but did you never feel that calling? Because we only get little glimpses of mm. Scottish society. I mean, for me, uh, Capaldi and I'm the thick of it. Oh, oh, I mean it's just fantastic you know and it's just I, I, I automatically think you know he <laughs> he's saying what we would all say each other I, going I, out in a I, pub I, you know yeah. and he doesn't hold back with the language I know oh, it's genius my favourite my favourite um, Malcolm Tucker line is oh it's so funny he said he, he basically he's talking to the journalists and he's briefing them and they've been to see the other guy who's into blue sky thinking uh, and he says, "Oh, you've been to see him, have you? What's his latest? What's his latest scheme? Is it um, bounty castle for single mothers, <laughs> or, or has he, or has he hired someone to count the fucking moon?" <laughs> oh, oh, so funny! And he's so good at it. Do you know the story of how he got the gig? What well, he had been. Um, it was the second audition that day, right? Yeah. And he said, "Everyone thinks that I knew Armando before because we were both Glasgow Italians." Uh, with a Bishop Briggs connection, I think, but we didn't. We never actually met. I don't think they'd met. And anyway, so anyway, uh, he had, had to audition for it, right? And it was his second audition that day. And he said, the first audition, he said, "Look, I'm not an arrogant man in any way. How could I be? I'm Scottish." But um, I auditioned for a thing that I really shouldn't have had to audition for. It was like three lines, and, and I got a bit naughty, like, "What the fuck am I doing? Here? <laughs> Hold ass across town for this." And he took that anger to the second audition. Yeah. And that's why Malcolm that's Tucker got, was the energy. Yeah. Because if you think about Peter Capaldi before that, brilliant actor, but he's always quite genteel. I mean, if you think about him in The Crow Road, for example. Yeah, I, I never had him. Yeah, or uh, Local Hero, which was his very, very first job. He freely admits he'd never worked, because he was like a, he'd been in art school and been in bands. Yeah. So he'd never acted before. So you see him in Local Hero, he said, I literally was trying not to walk in the doors and hit my marks and all that. Um, but he'd always play quite very likeable, genteel people. And I love it when people play against type. It's brilliant. I was in a film called Filth. Yes. Uh, well, I say I'm in it. I'm in the DVD extra. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, the, it, it was a time thing, apparently. Uh, I was, it, was, it, was, it was a beautiful job, though, because it was like I was in two scenes, right? I had something like 17 words, right? But my, my first day filming was in Sweden and the second was in Belgium. Brilliant. Who cares, lovely who, job. Who cares yeah. about 17 words? You're Brilliant. there. <laughs> But it meant that I got to hang about with James McAvoy and Eddie Marsan, who are two amazing actors. Before that film, though, I mean, I don't know about his stage work, but certainly in, in his on-screen work, James McAvoy had always played quite likeable, affable people. Yeah. But his character, Bruce Robertson, in that film is, is one of the most irredeemable characters in, <laughs> in, in, in literature. I mean, that, in the book, he's even worse, actually. Um, and Eddie Marsan, who I had a chance to spend a lot of time with, is a really lovely guy. He's a Buddhist. And he's, a, he's like a socialist and really, really, really sound guy, but had always played really horrible people. And he played a real ingenue, quite angelic kind of, um, who gets corrupted by, 
by, by, by Robertson's character. And I think it's really brilliant when people are played against type. And I think that's possibly why Malcolm Tucker had that extra level. I love him. Because if you know Peter Capaldi's work, you're like, where's that coming from? It's, a, it's, a, it's another a level of joy. Yeah. Do you know what you've got in common with James McAvoy? Go on. Paul McStay. Oh. And the reason I know that is because <coughs> James McAvoy, huge movie star, but it just shows you Scottish culture. Um, I'm hosting an event one night. Paul McStay's there. Yeah. Uh, Paul McStay and I are standing at the end of the bar, and James says, Let's, Can we all get a photograph? <laughs> can we get a photograph? And I thought, Doesn't matter if you're in the X Men. Uh, when Paul McStay's at the end of the bar, you've got to get your photograph taken. Well, let well. me give you the flip of that, <laughs> Peter. Um, I was very lucky to be invited to the 50th anniversary of the Lisbon Line at the Hydro, right? And I was, I was off the subs bench because I got, <laughs> I got a DM from Celtic PR and said, look, I know this is cheeky, but Kevin Bridges has had to pull out because Obama's in town. Do you remember he had to Yeah, I remember he was a... uh, he, he did a whole... I'd love to see how that went down, him talking about hoose rice. <laughs> Michelle was like, what? What's hoose rice? <laughs> um, so I, they said, look, would you be able to, to come on? It'll be a couple of minutes. Um, you can, you know, we'll give you, you can invite family and stuff and you'll either be introducing Eddie Reader or um, Rod Stewart. I said, like, I'm going to say no to that. Rod, of course I'm going to say yes to that, right? So um, I went along and um, well, a, couple of, a couple of very funny things happened. Because I knew there were two jokes I could do that no one else could do. And you, I don't know, you weren't there that night, were you? No, no. Oh, it was such a joy to be able to do this. It was a full hydro. And like, Alex Ferguson, Ken Douglas were there, Neil Lennon, Gordon Strachan. I mean, the, the, everyone was there. Harry Hood, who I went to school with, Harry Hood's sons, it was lovely seeing him again. And um, so I went on stage and, and I, was, um, I was saying, uh, what, what a joy it is, what a joy it is to celebrate the Lisbon Lions. I, I might be naive, but I think that it doesn't matter what your, your football um, um, uh, legacy is or what, what team you support, you can't deny that this squad of players from this tight radius of, from Glasgow um, went on and they won the biggest club championship in the club, club trophy in the world big roar obviously it's a captive audience big roar right yeah and then I dropped into a bit of Navid I said everybody loves the Lisbon line <laughs> will I say that there's one person who doesn't he Mina <laughs> it was like Ooh. <laughs> he hates the Lisbon line Ooh. I said to her, why why do you hate the Lisbon lines she said because they ruined our holiday <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking about they ruined a holiday to Sri Lanka, they bombed the airport. That's the Tamil Tigers, you dozy <laughs> bastard. Right? Well, that's a okay joke. No, that's got, good, you got, got away with it. Got, yep. right, I got away with it. And, and then I, and I stayed in the vid and said, uh, but the other reason I wanted to come to Niger is I love Brendan Rodgers. He's, a, to me, a superhero. Huh? Uh, and this got also a big roar because he was, there was, it was the, the first wave, right? Um, more than 100 points, way. More than 100 goals, way. Invincible for the season, way. But more than any of those reasons, the reason he's a superhero is he's the only human to kiss Lee Griffiths and no get pregnant. Right? <laughs> I thought it was an okay joke. A minute. Is that right? A minute. I had to stand there and wait for them to finish, right? <laughs> this is just this is the best moment of my life. This is heaven. And then I said, uh, please welcome to the stage uh, Eddie Reader. And I, and I went I, I went back. And I could and, and next to come and see was Martin Comston with a big Celtic scarf. And I know Martin. Yeah. But next to him was this. Um, it was really weird. It was kind of like a really really bright light at kind of on a stand. Except it wasn't. It was Brendan Rodgers' teeth. <laughs> Brendan Rodgers was standing next to Martin Thompson. I know he's a really small. In fact, he's uh, probably the same age as Martin. And, and, and I went yeah. and I just, I don't, he probably didn't even hear what I said because when you're backstage, you don't always hear. Yeah. But I just went and said, Did you hear that? And I told him what he said, I gave him a cut off. I said, you're, you're brilliant. And that was the one and only time I met Brendan Rodgers having, no, I didn't roast him, I suppose, I just referred to him. Yeah. But the reason I brought that up was, was on the way into the gig, um, they'd kind of, um, it was in the hydro, but the SEC was part of it and they'd let these kind of like these tunnels and stuff that the, fake tunnels so everyone could be undercover and I'm coming down the escalator in the SEC and a, a, a man's waving at me so kind of way back I realise it's Bobby Lennox so I make a beeline for him and say no 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 you don't wave at me I wave at you <laughs> but, you know, this is weird though isn't it yeah absolutely um, and it's we always see you at the PFA awards 
And it's just, it, it's so lovely that, you know, footballers are wanting selfies with me. I'm like, I can't, this is brilliant. It's great. It's fantastic. Well, because everybody has people that give them a moment of enjoyment in life and, uh, and they want to share it and they want to be able to be associated with it. I just wonder about, you, you mentioned uh, Navid there and I mean, I've been in your company and I know we do things for show races and the red card where you can stand up and you can deliver those lines, funny, people laugh. Um, but there are times when I feel some people are on your case and say, do Navid, do Navid, do Navid. Do you view it as a golden, uh, you know, as a golden nugget in your pocket or do you sometimes view it as oh, it's, a, it's a hindrance around my neck? Very much a golden nugget because I know that um, Alan, uh, Steve Coogan's got a love-hate relationship with Alan Partridge. Yeah. And you know, because I'm the last time I saw him live, he, he, uh, he, he you know, because what happened with, with Steve Cooper with Alan Partridge is, is that I think he did get a wee bit scunnered with it because he did other things, yeah, like Paul Carr, Pauline Carr, Tony Farino, um, Saxon deal, but they were never getting the love that Partridge got. If I were him, I would say, well, that just shows you how good Partridge is, it doesn't denigrate anything else. If you created something that makes that impact, then go with it. You Absolutely, know, enjoy you know, it. at the end of the day, I look at that and say to myself, well, wait a minute, you, you've created the 911, the 944 is not really that good a car, but just <laughs> just wallow in it because he's yeah. a genius. Yeah, um, but, but I think he did get scholar with it. But I remember when I went to see him live and he did, he did, he did um, Partridge. At the one point he goes, I'll do it then. Aha, 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 aha. Uh, he, he, did, he did it comedically long and obviously it was it was part it was obviously a joke but you got the sense that fucking he's, done with it. he's pissed off but to be fair he's now I don't know if you've heard the podcast that he's done the, from the Oast House with Alan Partridge or the the spoof of the one show that he did no I haven't heard that yet uh, it's brilliant and he's got new writers on board and they've given it a real kind of um, kind of kick up the arse but I mean yeah. I I revert to Alan Partridge when I can't help myself I'm a zombie I'm having a pop up the undead I can't help it I just revert to Partridge <laughs> in my weaker moments so I think of that when people ask me to do Navid I think enjoy it because yeah. also as well Peter this is in a slightly more serious point I mean I can't claim to have written Navid Ford, Kieran and Greg Hempel write every single word of still game they had the foresight to write a prominent Asian shopkeeper character which yeah. I had thought about but I never thought would catch on it's that, that, that Connolly thing I thought oh it's funny for me it's funny for the world I never maybe had the confidence to but they recognised this character, wrote it beautifully. I brought what I brought. I could, I could bring my authenticity, which was I knew if I played like my dad, yeah. but a Ouija version of my dad, <laughs> then that, was, that, would, that would work. Yeah. Um, Did they come to you first? Were you first choice? Well, yeah. Um, the way it worked actually was um, they asked me about it. There's a slightly longer story actually, which is worth telling. When I was writing for Tune the Facts, I used to write for Tune yeah, the Facts. Yeah, I know Facts. that. And I, I'm in one sketch, did you know that? Well, I was looking, I, as I was doing all my research for it, I'm looking, I'm thinking, right, how many episodes was he actually in? <laughs> in Tune the Facts? Yeah. One, one sketch? Yeah. Because I wasn't really an actor at that point. I was yeah. still writing and presenting at that point. But the banter boys were just here for the banter. Yeah. New Year's special, they go to get a curry. And they filmed it in my cousin's restaurant, The Spice of Life, which isn't there anymore. And I'm the waiter that talks them through the curries. Right. right. That's the one sketch I was in, but I used to write like the Lonely Shopkeeper and the Sports Sock sketch and the Dixon's Boys, the guys with the teeth yeah. to try and sell you guarantee. Which is great. Mm. I mean, that <coughs> observation came from, you know, when you're buying a fridge freezer. Oh, and then, there's always somebody. And then it's the warranty bit. <laughs> and they get, they got a hold of your name and they rip the arse out of your name. So, Peter, how's it going? Peter Boy, how's it? Peter, Paul and Mary, right? Yeah. Right, Pete, 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 Yeah. And, and then they fucking, they tie themselves in knots and eventually they end up insulting you by mistake. <laughs> So that was what that was the kind of the start point for that, um, and they did a brilliant job of the, the teeth were their idea. I don't know where that came from, but <laughs> very funny. And um, weirdly, those teeth are now fashionable. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's buying them. Visible from space, <laughs> Turkey to Jupiter. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, so I used to write between the fat, and then four Greg and I live uh, quite near each other. And uh, um, we all use the same convenience store. Yeah. And it was an Asian family that ran it, right? Isn't it great that there's no database? It's by, there's a guy around the corner I, that I, may be ideal. I know, <laughs> completely, exactly, exactly. It's all word of mouth. Um, and um, uh, I used to know the son, right? He was a guy called Povin. He's quite quite a charming guy. I used to wear Versace shirts and chat the ladies up. Do you want some black magic? Get a chocolate. And but his dad was funny in a different way. And he was more, and, and, and Ford being the master of voices, nailed his accent, he'd, he'd have us howling laughing with his impersonations. Uh, and he actually, he said to me, when we're doing Tune the Fat, he said, 
would it be totally off if I, as in Ford, did this Asian shopkeeper character? Now, obviously, now it's that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Dive, you know, Little Britain, Bow Selector. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, no, it's no. Yeah. But at the time, what I said to him was, I said, look, I don't have a problem with it because it's not like you're trying to, to impersonate a whole race of people. You're yeah. doing one guy and you're doing it really, really authentically. You're doing a better accent than I could do. But also there's an affection there. So I actually don't have a problem with that. But um, if you need someone to keep you right in terms of writing the character, then, you know, I'll definitely help you out. Sort of thing. And it, never, it didn't happen. Probably a good thing, right? Yeah. So when Tune the Fat finished and Still Game came along, the boys approached me again. They said, oh, remember that Asian shopkeeper character? I said, look, my offer still stands. I'll help you write it. He said, no, I'll play him. I'm like... How many acting roles had you had before that? Very few. I had, at that point... Um, I used to write and perform a show called, it was Sanj and Donny's Shredded Week. So I, um, I write with a guy called Donny McCleary, who might be the funniest man in the world, actually. We write together, have done since 97. And um, um, we used to do this, it was a listing show, right? So it's called Shredded Week. So yeah. the week is shredded. So the idea is, if you watch this show, um, we'll recommend a film, we'll recommend a play, we'll recommend a book, and we'll give you a soap roundup. But it was actually a sketch show, because we did it all in character. Yeah. So the guys that did the arts roundup were me and Donny playing Neds. It was kind of before Neds had kind of been done on the yeah. telly. All right, ladies, Marlene, don't take it. It's in my blog of Enda. <laughs> hey, today we've been to the Taunt Theatre to review our bad magnet. <laughs> and we end up reviewing the toilets. Like the, the urinal trunk smelled the pineapple. And stuff like that. It was a bit stupid, but you know. And then Donny would review the films. as this quite camp guy who lived with his mother. <laughs> And he'd do, this, he'd do the soaps roundup as El Emperor Palpatine from Star Wars. <laughs> so it was off its head, right? So we, did, we, we wrote ourselves these kind of quite kind of big um, uh, things. And I, I didn't even see it as acting. I just, it, was, it was like, sh shout with wigs on. But it was acting, really. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of doing that Scottish thing, yeah. deprecating. Doing yourself a disservice, yeah. to be honest with you. So, but, but then, so I hadn't done a huge amount of that. So yeah. that was my first issue was, ah, I'm a, I'm a ready for this. Yeah. Also, um, everyone knew Jack and Victor from Still Game. Yeah. Or from the original, from Tune the Fat, rather. Tune the Fat, yeah. Or the original state, Still Game stage play, which predated Tune the Fat. And they also had an idea of the other two old guys that did the songs. So they had an idea of Jack and Victor and what became Tam and Winston, right? But they didn't know Isa. Yeah. Or Bobby or Naveed or Mina. So I'm thinking, well, we're the newbies. Had they an idea in their mind or did they have a script that they were showing you? At that point... I don't think there's a script at that point. There was still, but it was definitely going to be the thing. Right. So I didn't know really. Um, but um, I was worried that if the thing didn't work, then will that be on us? Because they love Jack and Victor and they love Tamar Winston. They might, it might be the new, and also being the Asian cats and they think, well, we're the thing that's the most new. We might be the thing that breaks this. Yes. Thank God we didn't, right? So I had my reservations, but I thought, obviously I'm going to say yes. And Greg had always said to me when I'm personally, my dad had made him laugh. But I still had to audition. Yeah. And I'm glad I did because I had to prove to myself, I think. I didn't want to just get the gig because then it'd be, I'd always have that thing in my, oh, did I just get this because I was pals with Greg and Ford? But how, how good, you know, I, I mean, the two of them, great writers mm. because there are so many different characters and all of them actually are likable to people. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's all right writing one really good character. Or if you create Jack and Victor, everybody knows the plot. Mm. They know the, you know the substance of the two guys. But to suddenly have you, the imaginary Mina in the Aye. background, you know, and then you've got Winston, you know, it's it's incredible that they managed to create something that was each had their own personality and each had their own kind of a lines that made people laugh. I think they were very generous with dishing the lines out. I mean, uh, they, could have yeah. made it the, they could have made the Jack and Victor show and they didn't. Yeah. I know that they're both massive fans of The Simpsons and huge fans of The Simpsons and they love that thing of like, you know, if you ask people who's your favourite Simpsons character, well it changes because sometimes Homer gets all the best lines, sometimes it's Marge, sometimes it's Chief Wiggum, yeah. sometimes it's Hello everybody, the doctor. <laughs> so even like kind of walk-on or like walk-ons or, 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 or obviously like um, uh, uh, Willie the Groundsman, questionable accent. But <laughs> I do like him. Have you been fighting all day? Um, so I think that was maybe the template was, uh, you know, but it, what a joy. I mean, like you say, they shared the lines out. We all had our kind of um, our own uh, niche niche sort of yeah. thing. And what we could bring as actors was, was, like I say, all scripted by them, genius. 
but we could bring our, our authenticity in, and I know for a fact that we've all based our characters on people that we know. So for me, it's my dad. For uh, Greg, it was his granddad, who, who was from Mary Hill. For Ford, it was his uncle Barney. Yeah. How did uh, your dad take it? Loved it. Did he? Because that's I, great. Well, I mean, it, it, it's it, the ultimate recognition, I have to say. Well, we, we used to go to um, the, because uh, my, my, my dad isn't Ouija. So like, yeah. so my dad speaks like this. Uh, uh, we're going to Macro to buy a block of cheese the size of a hatchback car. Have you checked the pressure in your tires? Have you checked the pressure in your boiler? A lot of pressure questions. Yeah. Um, so I just, but having spent, I mean, I grew up in Bishop Briggs, which was very vanilla, and I went to St. Al, St. Aloysius, which is mostly second and third generation Irish and Italian families. So I didn't really have brown pals until Sunday when I went to Sikh Temple, and then you would hear these guys talk like this and they eat. <laughs> I, I went to Langside College with a guy that ate sport like this. He used to say, thing is, since you've been eight, I've got cousins here, I play hockey. If anybody wrongs me, I break their legs with fucking hockey sticks yard. And this was music to my ears, this total clash of Glasgow and, and, and India, or Pakistan. So I had that on my hard drive. Yeah. So when it came to Naveed, I thought, well, I can do my dad, but just VG up a bit, because my dad wouldn't say quality or dinner torties or... Girly Burley. But what a great, what a great, like, kind of a back catalogue to call on. Oh, completely. Your dad, Indian humour. Yep. Suddenly you're in Glasgow. I mean, <clears throat> the great, <laughs> the great thing about it is, you, you know, your family slap bang in the middle of a place which, I don't know at the time, I was, I was, I was curious to ask you about <clears throat> the racism mm -hmm. and whether it played a part in your life, but if it played a part in your life, would it be... Would, it, would I be wide of the mark saying, well, hang on, hang on a minute, you're in the middle of sectarian country? <laughs> no, no, I mean, that that was, you, you're right, because um, I, 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 oh, I, I used to do this joke about my, my gran, had an irrational hate of Muslims, and, but she was never up to her knees in their blood. Yeah. You know I mean? So, well, right, cut that. Um, <laughs> that Marine just fancy me. Um, no, but yeah, you're right, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, so, in fact, I don't know if you know this, Peter, but a lot of um, Pakistanis in Glasgow, of people of Pakistani descent, are Celtic supporters because of the green yeah. flag. Is that right? And a lot of Indians support Rangers because the Pakistanis support Celtic. Yeah, well, Sati Singh's a big Rangers fan. Yeah, Oleg. Yeah, uh, Oleg as well is a great, it's, it's a great story, isn't it? Well, it's actually, we go, by the way, Richard Goff, he was in here last night, he likes it mild, he likes it wee chasney. Then he's aye, aye, he likes it a bit spicier. Oh, I love Sati Singh, he's so funny, no surrender. Yeah, he's uh, brilliant. He's so, he's a total diamond, isn't he? So yeah, a lot of like, um, uh, like Sikh, Sikhs in Glasgow are Rangers fans. Yeah, it's funny you say that because a lot of my mates who are in uh, in Edinburgh when I lived there, they they are all Rangers fans mm. because the Italians because you know they associate with the, the, the Rangers players that were signed yeah. in the nineties. You know, yes. and, and uh, yeah, yeah. they're heavily Rangers. You know, yeah, yeah. it's a strange thing. The, it's a where good does, thing. Where, where, does Nodi, where does Nodi fit into this? Where does the Canyon fit into this? Exactly. I know it's as it's as crazy as that. But by the same token, you're a great sense of humour to draw on as well. Mm. Well, the thing about being an outsider is, and I was always an outsider, I'm, and that's worked for me. I, I, I like being an outsider in a lot of ways. Yeah. Actually, it wasn't great being an outsider when you're 13, right? but it's absolutely worked for me now because if you think about it, um, um, I'm, I land in Glasgow when I'm three years old, so I've already got an English accent, and that was probably the thing that I hated the most. I mean, I used to try and ramp it up. I'd say, a single ticket to Bishop Briggs, please, driver! Because I hated <laughs> Even now, when I say word or bird, yeah. I say purple burglar alarm. I don't say purple burglar alarm. I struggle. Plus, I've got Invisalign's in. Um, so, that, I've got that going on. I'm also Asian. I'm specky. And back then, I mean, it was just the ashes. There was nothing else. Yeah. And usually I had a bit of plaster here. And, oh, and, just, and my mum and dad thought that was too easy, so they sent me to a free paint Catholic school. Yes. So, I mean, I'm I, everywhere I go, I don't yeah. understand what's going on. You're what I call the equivalent of, by the way, you're lucky, you're going to Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> and they're going to be firing at you yeah. from all angles, yeah. you know. But, you Did know, you get a lot of it when you were younger? No, it was absolutely fine. It was, yeah. it was just to add that slight outsider's perspective. I mean, I've told this story before, someone in primary six... And it wasn't even racism. It was just that kind of child logic. He said, Coley, you've got brown skin. I said, aye. He said, does that mean you do white jobbies? <laughs> but, you, you got a laugh because it's that's... The, childlike way you think of it, isn't yes, it? Yes, I do. <laughs> All those ones you saw in the 70s? It was an Asian fella. <laughs> Wasn't that a dog? Um, do Asian dogs do white jobs? I don't know. So um, there was that. I mean, I look, I grew up in Bishop Briggs, uh, north of Glasgow. 
very, very wimpy estate. We could play Kirby and a car wouldn't hit you. It was very nice, caused upbringing. Got sent to a fee paying Catholic school. It was all fine. Weirdly, actually, I think, I think I'm probably right in saying that I didn't get, I didn't really feel that I got a lot of abuse at, at St. Aloysius. And I think the reason was, was that a lot of them were second or third gen gen generation immigrants, you know what yeah. I mean? And they kind of, I, I felt sort of weirdly at home there. Yeah. Uh, despite the fact there's only three Asians in the place. I mean, what I will say is, in primary seven, um, we had, uh, one of the subjects was RK, religious knowledge. It wasn't RE at that time, it was religious knowledge. Yeah. And the, there was there was exams. You had exams from primary four in St. Aloysius, right? So that's why I'm so good at them. Um, so in primary seven, there was an RK exam and it was in two bits. There was the written bit, the catechism, who made you, God made me, why did God make you, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and there was this project. So I got 20 out of 20 for the, for, the, for the bit and another guy got 20 out of 20. So the prize was going to come down to who did the best project. And I did a beautiful project. I had a bishop's mitre, a crook, it was all annotated. I spent loads of time on it, colouring in. And the other guy's was all right, but not as good as mine. Yeah. And he got the RK prize. And I kind of knew then that they're not going to give it to the one non-Catholic in the building. <laughs> That's not a good look. <laughs> so there was that going on as well. Yeah. I felt like, wait a minute, they never made me prefect. I'd, I'd always kind of arse, they never made me prefect, but then I, I kind of knew. Yeah. But then I remember there's one incident as well, oh my God. This really actually, this was the most infuriating thing that happened at school. It was third year and I was a model student. I mean, I was, I was that guy, head down, arse up, all the A's. The joke was I could never become a beekeeper because I didn't know what a bee looked like. <laughs> and um, I loved Latin and languages. Yeah. And um, so I was really good at Latin. I actually weirdly enjoyed it. Don't judge me. And uh, the teacher pulled me up after class and I was just all about it. And he says, now obviously I don't have a problem with your work, but um, I have noticed Sanjeev, that uh, if I say anything that could be misconstrued as a double entendre, <laughs> that you're turning around to James and to David and you're having a little snigger. Now, this is this is the killer. Now, because you're not Catholic, I don't quite know how to broach it with you, but I'm just going to ask you to stop. I'm thinking, where's the... <laughs> uh, you caught me red-handed. This is, this is like a, you know... What's it got to do with being Catholic? Yeah, I was going to do say I, some secret code to jokes. Yeah, do, 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 I, do I have no moral framework because I'm not a Catholic? <laughs> of course, I didn't say any of this. I just yeah. you know, went with it. Um, so that was slightly irritating. In terms of actually kind of more direct racism, I mean, if I went into town of a, of a Saturday in the 80s, because that's when I was old enough, yeah. I'd be surprised if I, if I wasn't called something Right? And it wasn't an issue. Yeah. You just, you just, it became your normality. I was never attacked. I was never hit or anything. Yeah. It was called names. Again, what would annoy me was if they got the ethnicity wrong. Yeah. If someone calls me a little black sambo, what I want to say to them is, at least call me a package. Do you know what I mean? At least get it right. Yeah. If you're, go if you're going to be abusive. Yeah. It's funny actually you say that because my, I had a friend who, he was, always a, he was always at a loose end at the weekend uh, and then when I said, look, come through, all our family, we all have our meal after church, you know, come through. And he got more and more nervous as we got to about shots. And then he said to me, and his, all, all his family came from Kenya, and he said to me, you know, Peter, he was very well spoken, um, <clears throat> well educated. And he said, Peter, he says, do you think your family will care that I'm black? And I said to him, Paul, my family won't really care that you're black, I says, but when they find out you're a Rangers fan, <laughs> you're in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I eased the pain yeah. because we're coming to the west of Scotland, you know, and it's like, it's yeah. the madness of it all, you know. And what I'll say as well is, is that, is that uh, Glasgow is incredibly welcoming. Um, I asked my dad, um, I did a documentary a few years ago when Glasgow had the Commonwealth Games in 2014. And yeah. it was, I belonged to Glasgow. And obviously I was quite a good subject for that. So it was myself, uh, I did one, Kanda Mar did one, Elaine C did one and um, Alex Norton. But I obviously had loads of brilliant angles because not born here, parents certainly not born here, see, going to Catholic school, da da da, humour. Uh, and I asked my dad a question which had, had, had never occurred to me to ask him. I said, when did you feel welcome in Glasgow? He said, about 20 minutes after I got here. He said, I didn't fully understand what people were saying, but I felt like I was welcomed. So that, you know, that's absolutely part of the story as well. Yeah. But it's weird. I was actually thinking back to an incident that might have even, because I love wordplay. I'm really big into wordplay. I love crosswords. My Twitter feed is full of really tortuous puns, um, which really anger people for some reason. But I think I know where it started, right? And I only worked this out quite recently. So I must have been about eight or nine. And um, we're in town and we're all smartly dressed. My mum's in a sari, my dad's wearing a suit, he's got his turban on. 
And so we must have been coming from some kind of wedding, right? We were just where the concert hall is. So now it's all gentrified, but back yeah. then it was like a tramp's mattress. It was where the Apollo was. Absolutely, it was rough. It was rough as rough as a badger's arse. Yeah. I just remember thinking it was six o'clock on a Saturday. It was getting a wee bit dark. I don't want to be in town on a Saturday with my turban seat dad and my mum wearing a sari and me and my glasses and my English accent. I don't want to be here. Yeah. I want to get to that Volvo, which is ours, <laughs> so I get hooked to Bishop Briggs so I can watch Game for a Laugh because I don't want to be here now. Yeah. It just felt like the, the night crows are coming out. Yeah. And that, as, I, as I'm thinking that scenario, these Hell's Angels come around the corner. I'm like, they all look like Lemmy from Motorhead. Yeah. Turban seat dad, mum and Asari, us. We're walking that way. There's no avoiding them. The Volvo's over there. There's no avoiding them. They're like this. Seven of them were like that, five of us. And I guess it's just part of being even slightly different, not just an Asian thing. You just think worst case scenario. Yeah. Just, just prepare yourself. So I'm thinking, he'll knock my dad's turban off. He'll pull my mum's sorry. He'll spit in my face. He'll break my glasses. He'll hang me from a flagpole. Very fertile imagination. So I'm just thinking all this stuff. And then the head guy, the most lemmy looking to the guy, right? He, he, he did this with the shades. And he said to my dad, I hope you seek what you're looking for. And walked away. He did a pun. And I'm wondering whether that, in my wee mind, thought, oh, puns. Yeah. <laughs> actually diffuse tension. Must something, I think maybe yeah. that's what it was. Here's a, here's a question for you. It's a, <clears throat> it's a big dilemma because obviously it was a lovely story there you tell about your dad and he felt at home 20 minutes into to arriving in Glasgow. So from that perspective, you've, um, you're obviously uh, born in England. Yes. Uh, so, with the, with the kids, I mean, what about the kids? Who are they playing for? Are they playing for England or Scotland? Well, it's a big dilemma. This is true. Um, <laughs> I, I um, uh, my brother made a documentary called In Search of the Tartan Turban years ago, and that was all about issues of identity and whatnot, right? And uh, so, my nephew, Kieran, who, God, he just turned 30, actually, he would have been maybe 12, 13 at the time. Big, lo loved football, right? So my brother asked him, he said, so Kieran, your dad is, um, he was born in England. No, no, he's born in Kenya, spent his childhood in England, then moved to Scotland of Indian origin. Yep. Um, so, so, um, so in fact, yeah, his dad was born in Kenya, his mum was born in the Punjab, right? Your mum is Scottish of Irish extraction. So if you wanted to play international football, you could play for Scotland, England, India, Kenya, or Ireland. Yes. Who would you choose? And he went, Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's absolutely no question my kids would play for Scotland. Yeah, okay. No <clears throat> question at all. Now, here's a here's the thing. You get to a certain age and you've achieved <clears throat> certain things which are in the, the culture of our society, which is great to be remembered for all those uh, good things. Is there something now that you're thinking, right, w w I, I want to achieve something else? Do you do you crave, and I'm not for a minute suggesting that, <coughs> excuse me, still game is your 15 minutes of Andy Warhol, but do you crave something else to get you there? Or do you do what you do now to think, well, I'm in this zone, I'm happy doing what I'm doing, and I don't need that adrenaline rush again? I've been very lucky with still game in the beat. And I've got Ford and Greg to thank for this, that, that what that's given me, you know, I've been on the high, the stage of the hydro 51 times. Um, I've met Chris Commons. I shot it from meeting Ken Dunley. <laughs> no, it's been so good to me. And, um, you know, I, I've, I've said, you know, you're saying before about do I find it a bind to when people ask to do Naveed, do Naveed. I, I've, I've said it in print, I'll be buried as Naveed. Yeah. You know, people can throw curly whirlies into my coffin. Um, I'm happy to be known as that guy and do other work. I, mean, I do other stuff. I, I played a, a character in a show called Look Around You. I don't know if you know it. It was a, it was a spoof of Tomorrow's World. All right. And I played a character called Synthesizer Patel right. that loved Synthesizer so much he changed his name. And people still talk about that. So I've got that going on. Yeah. I've got my Radio 4 show, Fags, Mags and Bags, which has won awards and people really like that. Um, so I've got other things going on, but I'm happy just to do the work because I'm lucky. I've I've been part of a show that has made an impact, and in a way that you know constantly surprises me. I was doing a filming something. I can't remember what it was. Some kind of documentary. I was in a cafe in Glasgow, and uh, there was a guy, a joiner, putting putting tables together. Right, and he kept looking over. I could see him. Right, maybe twenty six, and I could tell he's really really nervous and didn't want to speak to me. Yeah. The thing is. 
I'm at a level of celebrity where there's people way more famous than me than less famous than me. Yeah. So I've lost my shit in front of people. So I know that feeling. So I thought Jobs could go speak to him and put, you know, like, rather than them having to, you know, because I could tell he wanted to, right? Yeah. It would be embarrassing if he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly. Um, so I went over and said, oh, how are you doing? How are you doing? What are you up to? Oh, I'm meeting these tables. Um, he said, I said, look, I don't be presumptuous, but are you wanting a selfie? Or oh, would you? Not a problem, not at all. He gets his phone out like that, shaking. I said, are you, are you shaking? Are you okay? He says, he says, you don't understand. I grew up in care. And still game got me through my childhood. Wow. And I know that's what comedy can do. Because I've been in situations not as bad as that. But, you know, friends got me through a breakup. And mm. I, I get the comfort that that can bring. I get also that a comedy can be a pal. Yeah. People tell me that they put still game on and it's like someone in the house. Like, they've seen it 20 yeah. million times. Plus, it takes you back to a place sometimes it's a comfort blanket. Of course, of course. You know? I watch Cheers and it makes me feel like it's Friday night. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> My wife said to us, well, I throw the, 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 the cover out for the box set. And I went, no, 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 we'll keep that. We'll keep it all intact. <laughs> Cheers is, I, I love Cheers. I love that, again, that was another one where everyone got good lines. Yeah. Um, but also the sense of, it was actually people being nice to each other as well. Because I, um, Bags, Mags and Bags, which is my Radio 4 show, is set in a Lindsay shop and I play Ramesh Marju. And he's like Sam Malone. Yeah. He knows everyone's business, whether he wants to or not, but he uses it as a force for good yeah. to bring people together. So I could always call it like a dry cheers. Uh, I heard a brilliant story about, about uh, Ted Danson. He was filming Loch Ness. Remember Loch Ness? Yeah, I remember it. me only see once. Um, 94, I think they were filming it. Yeah. And all the cars were put up in this big rambling kind of B&B &B, um, near Loch Ness. And there was a, there was an older Scottish actor. It might have been, uh, I can't remember who it was, right? But like a well-respected old Scottish actor, I wish I could remember who it was. Yeah. Who's in the film. And they're all staying in the same place, right? And it was about 11 o'clock at night. He's learning his lines for the next day, right? And there's a knock at the door. It's 11 o'clock. Opens the door and it's Ted Danson with a bottle of single malt and two glasses, looking a bit glassy-eyed. And he said, oh, do you mind if I come in? Do you, want a, do you want a wee nip? He said, never say no to a nip. So pulls out a couple of, and it's a, like a proper, like a... Uh, measure. Proper measure of a properly expensive single <laughs> malt. So sipping away, and, and, and Ted Danson's not said anything, and uh, she says to him, um, are you okay? You seem a bit altered or something. He said... Uh, no, absolutely fine. Um, my agent just phoned me. Um, I'm getting a royalty check for worldwide sales of Cheers for $20 million. I felt I had to tell someone. Wow. That's magnificent, isn't it? Isn't it amazing? I mean, I won't get that for still game right well, now. Well, to, to be fair, it's uh, Netflix, I, think, I think Friends, they get $20 million a year. Yes. Because it's all over the place. It just shows you, yeah. you know, these the, these type of spin-offs for it. Although um, Naughty Holder still gets one great check for yeah. Merry Christmas, everybody. Yeah. Uh, before we finish, and, and by the way, I'd... I'd oh my God, was that it? I, no, no, but I was going to say to you, I'd written a list of questions, and the great thing about it is... <laughs> I haven't nailed any of them because we've gone off at a tangent, which is great. Um, because I, 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 am, all, I am a tangent. No, but I wanted to pick you. You can get that one. Um, uh, the, the, the thing that I think is good to pick your brains on is, you know, we go out for show races in the red card and you want to try and, you know, put out the right message. Mm -hmm. But in your um, volume of work, you'll be an inspiration to maybe people, um, you know, or, or, or of Indian descent. I really hope not, but because I, I want all the jobs. Well, I was going to say to you, but the other aspect of it is you're also an inspiration, a great inspiration, I think, to fellow Scots mm -hmm. who look and say, that's great, how can we get in there? How can we not necessarily be um, an avid? How can we do what you do, which is writer, comedian, actor? So I often wonder, well, what, what were the, the key comedians that you, you inspired you because oh well you know yeah. when i'm when i'm growing up you know you get used to your Morgan wises mm. you get your bob hope type humor i love the march brothers because mm. i just thought groucho was great that's where i kind of a yeah. based my kind of a nailing everybody who's in the audience right, right. um but he he was brilliant but as i grew older and get into politics heavily i love the way armando right. writes yeah but I used to love like guys like Bill Hicks. Oh God, I, I like the Bill Burr guy from New York now because yeah, yeah. there's an edge to them, you know. Bill Hicks, absolutely, he was doing stuff. 
I was chatting again to my pal Bill Dewar about Bill Hicks. He was completely underappreciated in America because he didn't like how political he was. Yeah. He, well, he's like the Lenny Bruce of his day, yeah. wasn't he? As he moved but on. The stuff that he came out with, and he was like, you know, James O'Brien from LBC. Yes. Um, he's not a stand-up, but he, he has a way of just like, because I mean, there's so much shite going on. I know. Like being in a diarrhea storm. But if somebody's phoning him and he's got a way of highlighting their stupidity. But it, but it's, it's his laser focus. <laughs> yeah. Which is amazing. He's got a way of distilling all the nonsense. Go away, fly. Yeah. He's got a way of distilling the nonsense into just like, yeah, that, that's what I want. I want to see things as clearly as you see it, as James O'Brien sees it. And Bill Hicks was the same. Yeah. He would distill it all down, you know? I mean, I'm a big, having been to a Catholic school, I'm so anti-religion, it's not true. Yeah. And when Bill Hicks does that stuff, of forgive me. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, um, I, yeah. I love all that, but there's a bravery as well there. Yeah. I mean, there is. And of course, you there. mentioned that part of, you know, it doesn't matter what religion you are, there are some areas where there, it's taboo. I loved Monty Python. Yeah. I loved The Life of Brian. My mum said I should never have watched it. It was bang <laughs> out of order. It's, you know, it's a sin. And Derek and Clive, oh, the, the LP, yeah. is for me one of those things where, and there's a Monty Python LP where I could with my nephew recite it Aye. from one track to the next you yeah. know because it was it was almost things that you, you weren't allowed to listen to you know I, I do like that thing of being able to and Chris Morris is a hero of mine as well um, and um, he, I was lucky enough actually I met him I, I auditioned for the Four Lions film right and uh, it was funny because my wife didn't want me to get the gig she said well you're going to play a terrorist I said I know but it's Chris Morris and he's <laughs> having Asians <laughs> I might get to work with Chris Morris, but I got I got an audition, spent time with him. Yeah. Um, um, he's a guy that, yeah, he just, I mean, it, I think he says it himself, but it, he was a, a naughty child at school, just taking that to that next level, that Derek and Clive. Yeah. You know, you, those tapes went around. Bands used to pass around, didn't they? Yeah. Listen to that. I right? know, it was, yeah. that's what it was like, you know. Was I've so still got the LP and I'd never give it away. Aye, aye. You know? Man. So uh, that, that's, I mean, in, in as much as, it's a weird one. It's like people say, what kind of music do you like? I like good music. So yeah. I like Eric Morecambe, who I think I still adore Eric Morecambe, still a massive hero of mine. But then I really like, you know, like you say, Bill Hicks and Chris Morris at the very the much darker end of the scale. Yeah. I really like Michael McIntyre. I think he's very good at what he does. Well, as long as you know, I always say to people, you know, remember, it's like... It's like DJ, and remember you're playing for the audience, and remember what your audience is. Uh -huh. And if and if that's what makes you, if that's what makes you popular because you're really good at it, yeah, go on with it. I, I, and and I wonder. I mean, I I loved Woody Allen movies. Mm. You know, Woody Allen yeah. with my favourite line in a movie of all time. You know, don't knock masturbation. It's with someone I love. Uh, yeah. uh, so you know, the Woody Allen stand up. Oh, I shot a moose. Yeah, fantastic. Yuck! <laughs> the moose was furious. <laughs> Absolute genius. Yeah. So I'm going to finish on, uh, and I've thrown it at you, and I don't know why I'm throwing it at you, because sometimes I throw it with footballers and they talk about their favourite... But I do keep you up, is ...favourite player of all time. No, that's coming later, uh, uh, and I'll have an aside match. Um, favourite player of all time? Top five. Top top five. If I was giving you... Give me your top five. Top five movies of all time. Oh. Co comedic movies that you... Comedic movies? Yeah, the ones okay. that just... Absolutely. Okay. Raising Arizona. Right. Midnight Run. Yep. Uh, the Life of Brian. Um, oh, um, Jojo Rabbit, which I know is not really... It's an uncomfortable watch. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> um, what would that leave for five? Ooh, ooh. Yeah. Spinal Tap. Right, okay, yeah. there's your five. And, and, and the five comedians that you'd never tire of listening to or watching or paying to see? Billy Connolly, Eddie Azard. Um... I'll say Mandy Nucci and Chris Morse, but they're not really stand-ups, but they're such a big influence. And, um, and, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chuck in someone that you might not have heard of, a guy called Andrew O'Neill. Oh, no, Stuart Lee. I'll say Stuart Lee. I'll yes. Stuart Lee. Yeah. I, I like Stuart Lee um, as well. Listen, we, we need to do, you know, this is in its embryonic stage, this programme. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you back at some point so I can get the other 32 questions in yeah. that I was going to ask you in the first place. I don't know what you were asking me about the situation in the former Yugoslavia. Yeah. I, I wouldn't do anything about that. <laughs> I knew your dad did have an opinion on it, <laughs> honestly. But listen, I have to say to you, Sanjeev Kohli, that was an absolute joy. It was a breeze. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks for coming on. You know, I didn't enjoy it. That fucking fly. I know. By the way, what's never, your problem? You'll never, Everyone's a critic. You'll never believe it. I had Neil Lennon on the other day there, and it was a it was a wasp that just kept following him around. <laughs> and I thought, what is it these days? But listen, you were the star of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. Thank you. Cheers.